Good afternoon. Welcome to Black Hat. This is the Threat Intelligence track. Uh, this is Datagram, and he will be presenting on tamper evident devices. Data? Thank you. Is this on you? Turn on. Huh? All right. Oh, now it's on. Okay. Welcome. Uh, this is tamper evident devices. My name is Datagram. Uh, I'm a general douche. I work with tamper evident technologies, non destructive entry. A uh, whole lot of lock picking is essentially what that means, uh, safe cracking as well. Uh, I'm also heavily interested in forensics, particularly forensic locksmithing, which is uh, determining if anything other than a key has been used inside or to open a lock. I also do computer security, like all of you, so general bullshit term there too. Uh, and I run a couple of lock related websites, and hopefully, eventually, I'll have enough free time to make a tamper related website with much of the same information. So uh, we all work in security, fortunately, unfortunately. And there's a whole lot of snake oil. So we have all these terms. We have a lot of acronyms, a lot of things that don't really mean anything uh, to us as security professionals. So there's three terms uh, that are important for this talk. So tamper resistant, tamper proof, and tamper evident. So what's the difference between these three? Uh, a product that's tamper resistant actively s tries to prevent or deter tampering. Something that's tamper proof is mythological. Uh, that would imply that you cannot tamper with it in any way. Um, so in the same sense, we say lock is pick proof or software is hack proof. Uh, there's lots of things that say they are tamper proof. And what tampering means is also a gray area. And then there's things that are tamper evident. And so they're not necessarily tamper resistant, and they're certainly not tamper proof, but they're meant to leave evidence of tampering. So the, the general definition of something that's tamper evident is anything that leaves evidence of access, alteration, modification, replacement, anything that's not normal. Now you're thinking, well, a lot of stuff could be tamper evident. Uh, the mail we get, the basic you know, lick and seal envelopes, those are technically tamper evident, right? to a degree, uh, but there's a lot of things that are represented specifically to enhance your tamper evidence. Now you might say, why don't we just use locks? You know, why, why not just put a lock on there? A lock is technically supposed to be tamper resistant, right? Uh, and some locks are also tamper evident. But think of lock picking. How many of you have picked a lock in this room? See? Ah, you guys are awesome. Uh, how easy was it? Easy? Hard? Were you surprised that you could pick a lock so quickly with such little skills and a limited toolkit? Depends on the lock. Well, of course it depends on the lock. But all the locks we picked to start, well, we live in America where we all use shit locks to begin with. So they're all very easy for the most part. So why don't we just use locks? Why don't we lock up whatever we, want, we don't want accessed or altered or replaced? Uh, locks are expensive, very expensive. Locks usually come with keys, and then you have the whole problem of key management and key distribution and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we also have to consider, are we trying to prevent access or detect it? Because sometimes one is more, than, more important than the other. Uh, and then you also have to consider that locks need to function. Tamper-evident devices generally are one-way locks. They have no keys. They just lock up, and the only thing that they're supposed to do is leave evidence of them being unlocked. And one other thing is that uh, tamper devices force you to, to inspect them. If you have a padlock on your gate, you have your key, you go, the key works, and it opens, you really have no reason to take that lock apart and look for any evidence of lock picking or key bumping or any of these other attacks that we usually talk about in these conferences. But with tamper evident devices, you, you're meant to inspect them. That's their only reason for existing. So who uses this? Excuse me. Everyone, all of you right now, has bought, has on you, or has at home a tamper evident device. Uh, some are there because they're required to be there by law. Uh, some are there because people want them to be there so that you have confidence when you buy their product. And lots of other reasons. So food and drug packaging, all the medicine bottles you, you buy, all the food you buy. Uh, quality assurance, you know, saying that this has gone through inspection so it should meet factory specs. Uh, warranty fraud protection. So everyone, how many of you own uh, some sort of gaming console, a TV, a DVD player? Everybody, right? How many of you own a phone? All of those probably have little uh, tamper-evident seals on them to, uh, 
to ensure that you're not voiding your warranty, and to generally cover other people's asses. There's also transportation security. You know, you think, okay, I have my iPhone. Those have little seals. When they get shipped to whoever sells the iPhone, I don't have an iPhone. I don't know who sells and buys iPhones. But uh, you'll come to find during the course of this talk that I'm kind of a giant noob. So you can do 10 times better at all this than me. But think of, you know, from the manufacturer to the end user, end user how all those goods get shipped and stored and transported. Uh, all those use tamper devices in some form or another. And we're not talking about, you know, a big crate that has a tilt sensor or, or a water sensor. Those are generally uh, damage detectors. They, they also have tamper evident qualities. You know, if you consider you used water to open a crate or you tilted it and shook it to, to do whatever, they, they have some, uh, they leave some evidence, but they're not specifically designed for that per se. There's also this idea of confidentiality, information assurance. Uh, how many of you ever mailed a letter that has something important? How many of you have ever, well, in the same sense, sent an email that has a password in it? Think of it the same, but the physical side of things. So tamper devices are used to seal all those. Uh, and beyond that, uh, intelligence agencies and governments uh, are very, very dependent on tamper evident devices. Customs and Border Patrol uh, need all cargo to be uh, sealed with some sort of tamper evident device. Uh, we use them for nuclear safeguards, for transporting hazardous materials across the country, internationally. And we also use them for treaty enforcement uh, between different countries. So I think uh, United Nations, IAEA, uh, are responsible for doing the tamper evident seals for North Korea and so on. And that's so that when two countries agree, say, hey, let, let's stop making bombs, you know, it's hard to say, oh, okay. And then we don't just say, oh, oh, well, they agreed, so that's good. Uh, we put seals on them so that we have inspectors go inspect the seals and make sure that both sides are honoring their agreements. So we're going to go over uh, a brief history of tampering because it actually has a pretty rich history. Uh, and then we're going to talk about two main types of tamper seals. And we have a bunch of demos. Uh, there's been two talks in the last two years that relate to tamper stuff. Uh, one, unfortunately, was given by some government people, so they were uh, literally not allowed to discuss any vulnerability information. Uh, that changes today. And the other one was given some, by some friends of mine, and they didn't have time to demo. So both things are changed today. And hopefully we won't run out of time. So what we used to use a long time ago, the, the first kind of ideas we had for this were, you know, putting clay over something. Let's say we have a box. We'll seal it in clay and, you know, send it to, to person B. When they get it, they can look at the clay and look and see if it's been cracked. You know, the same way that if you go buy a steak, you look at all the plastic wrap on the steak to make sure it's not broken. And you can get some very complicated uh, seals with this. You know, this is essentially an early version of a wax seal. And here's a similar thing, where if you have some, a rope securing something, you put a clay seal around the rope and then put some stamps into it. So uh, when the person gets it at the other end, they should see that all these are intact and that it has not been tampered with. The Pope, I actually think this is a very cool story. The Pope has a ring, a little, a little papal ring, and he uses it to stamp wax seals on cool documents. Uh, there's a person responsible for melting down an outgoing pope's ring and making an, the next pope a new ring. So they have a, a pretty sophisticated tamper control with the, the pope. Uh, this is from uh, mid-1800s. We started combining locks and tamper seals. Uh, and if you see these, uh, you know, out in the wild, oh, speaking of in the wild, we have a Caesar's Palace fire extinguisher with a tamper seal on it. Which might come in handy in case we start a fire, which we'll talk about flammable stuff later. But anyways, they were mad that I took that, but that's okay. There is a flammable stuff, so we're good. Uh, they started combining uh, these stamps, and there's also some that have glass plates with locks. And you can see on the bottom here, there's a, a little hasp, and that covers the keyhole so that dirt and stuff doesn't get into it. Because, you know, again, locks are very sensitive mechanisms in some cases. So they, they open this up, they lock the lock, and then they put the stamp over the keyhole. So the next time somebody goes to unlock the lock, they can inspect this stamp to see if it, you know, obviously if there's a big hole poked in it. During World War I, World War II, uh, Vietnam, basically every war since, uh, since the Civil War, we've done uh, mail censorship here and there. And so have a lot of other countries. And so you could see on the left, we use a tape to say, you know, okay, this has gone through postal censorship, but then we also use an ink stamp. Oh, sorry.
All right? And then if you look up at the top left, you'll see they even wrote the language that the inside document was written in. And on top of that, for all of our mail, we use stamps to say that they've gone through the mail system. Uh, during the Cold War, the beginnings of the Cold War, beginnings of the CIA, uh, they had a lot of difficulty uh, getting agents into Moscow and getting information back from, from those agents. So what the CIA did is they did this very uh, thorough program where they sent hundreds or thousands of postcards. And they'd pick different postcards, they'd, they'd send them to different addresses to different people from different people, uh, you know, different messages to the recipient and so on and so forth. And they'd, they'd try and hide on some of these uh, secret ink. And then when they got to their destination, they'd examine them thoroughly, very, very thoroughly to de detect a, if there was tampering, B, what methods of tampering that the Russians might be using, and C, what letters have not been tampered with, and then identify characteristics of those to try and, you know, to, to get them through censorship. Because you can imagine all the mail, you know, even back then, you can't censor every single piece of mail going through your country. It's just not feasible. Uh, so they try and identify, say, if we do this, if we use this postcard, if we send it to this part of the world, it may not be censored and therefore we could put secret ink on it and be more ensured that, that it has not or will not be tampered with. During the 1980s, there was a big scare in Chicago where uh, people started dying from taking Tylenol, and they found out that some of the pills had been replaced with cyanide instead of Tylenol. And I think four or five people died, and to this day, they don't know how it happened. And Johnson & Johnson, uh, then I think still owner of Tylenol, said, you know, as far as the factory is concerned, we can't detect tampering. They, they seem fine after they left the factory. But uh, they still frantically pulled them off the shelves of Chicago. And after all this uh, kind of went down, we developed a federal anti-tampering act, I believe of 1982, might be 1981. Uh, and that led us to modern day seals, where now all pharmaceuticals are required to have these, these multi-layers of seals to get to the actual medicine. So if you think of your typical medicine bottle, we have to open the box. We have to take the plastic wrap off the, the, the container. Some of them have uh, uh, apparently childproof, but sometimes adult-proof lid to take off. And then below that is a combination wax and adhesive seal covering the actual pills. Again, talking about how many of you own Xboxes. Uh, previously, Microsoft used a, a warranty sticker that would you know, seal up the case that you would uh, theoretically have to remove the warranty sticker and then it would show uh, a residue saying it's void uh, on their Xboxes. And so people started making YouTube videos of, of them removing the warranty sticker and then opening it up and then modding their Xbox and so on and so forth. Uh, so Microsoft was like, well, we're, we're very proud of our, our product, but we're going to introduce a new seal. So now there's videos of this seal on YouTube being removed with a hairdryer and wax paper. So it's, it's cover your ass territory. Uh, and it's not very secure in the sense of leaving evidence of tampering. Uh, we use these a lot for evidence handling and uh, cash deposit transfers. And even, uh, I, I learned this recently, uh, duty-free bags, you can store certain so-called dangerous materials, chemicals particularly, you think aerosol cans and nail polish remover and that kind of stuff. As long as you, you get there with the sealed duty-free bag, then it's okay to take on the plane. So think of the implications of that if you were able to tamper those properly. And again, it depends a lot on, of course, the airport and the, if you're going through customs and where you're going and then who you are sometimes uh, of whether or not they're going to inspect this very thoroughly. But you, know, you can imagine if you have a sealed duty-free bag, you're probably going to be OK for whatever you're transporting. Uh, I just said we use these a lot in evidence handling, so sealing evidence bags. This is a, obviously just a manila uh, envelope. But we also have dedicated evidence bags that look a lot like the cash deposit bags that we talked about. And it's just a basic adhesive seal, for the most part. We use these a lot in electronics now. And this is where it kind of borders on tamper resistance. Because you know, the goal of a lot of these things is to, is to prevent reverse engineering and a lot of the, the hardware and software level attacks that, that all the rest of Black Hat talks about. So here's an example of a Motorola chip. Uh, and the leads are all covered in epoxy. So it makes it very difficult to remove the chip or have access to the leads. And then if you were to gain access, it should presumably be evident that you did so, because you'd have to remove the epoxy. And then it may or may not be very difficult to reapply it properly. And if you want to get even crazier, you can coat your whole chips in epoxy. And then you can't even see what's on it. 
And so this is more of a government level thing where they want uh, their, their crypto chips or for commercial purposes, a lot of DRM chips will just be completely covered in this stuff. So it still works electronically, of course, but it's much more difficult to reverse engineer. And it also should, again, theoretically leave evidence when you try and get rid of this stuff, because it's very hard to reapply. Uh, talking about phones, all of your phones probably use a water sensor. And if you take off the case, you'll probably see a bunch of uh, adhesive seals over all the little bolts that are necessary to take it completely apart. So those are used, again, for warranty protection to determine if you've taken your product apart. Uh, how many of you, well, you don't have to raise your hand, I suppose, but how many of you uh, have to take a piss test for work? Well, those also have little tamper seals on them, and so do things we use to store blood when it's getting transported from your arm to wherever blood goes in the hospital, and also on a lot of uh, other medicine bottles and, and, you know, dangerous chemicals in hospitals. <laughs> how many of you have power? So everybody, mostly. Uh, all of your little power meters use some kind of tamper seal on them to determine if you're tampering with your, your meter. Uh, this is one of the, it's called a bolt seal, and this is used for cargo transportation a lot. If you drove to or from Black Hat or, or DEF CON, uh, take a look at all the big rigs when you're stuck in traffic, wondering why they chose to put 10,000 people in one city for the weekend. Uh, and you'll find a lot of these things on the back of trucks, and it'll probably be combined with padlocks in the most cases. And they're just these little one-way locks that snap together and are very difficult to remove by hand or with machines. Uh, one thing that I might not have pointed out is none of these prevent theft. That's not their goal, only to evidence theft. So the actual removal method for this seal, when it gets, you know, the truck is to, to its destination, is to cut it off with bolt cutters. Of course, after you've inspected it and made sure that it's... it's uh, it does not indicate tampering. But all of these can be ripped off or removed very easily physically. Uh, the IAEA does uh, uh, treaty enforcement with North Korea. And they use this thing, it's called a cup seal. And this is, it's a two-part thing that snaps together, similar to the bolt seal. And the holes are so you could thread a wire through it, and then you could secure whatever you have. Uh, they take it to the next level, and they put these scratches here and little dabs of solder so that even if it were replaced, uh, it would be evident that it was replaced or tampered with. So, you know, when they install this, they, they do all this to the one half of it, they take a photo of it, and then they snap it together. The next time they do their inspection, they inspect the outside, of course, they cut it off, whatever they're going to look at, and then they cut it in half and look at this to make sure that this pattern is the same. Uh, this is a picture of Marines sealing a container of nuclear material. And if you notice, the seal that they're using is the exact same seal that was used in the photo of the man holding up the evidence bag. It's just a simple little sticker, basically. So as with most security products, there's a lot of strange representations of how these things are supposed to function. Is anybody in this room uh, uncomfortable removing a zip tie without damaging it? Ha, 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 right? I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding whatsoever. I found it hilarious that uh, uh, zip ties are sold as tamper-proof, almost universally. Now, maybe they don't mean that. Maybe they mean, well, once you store it on something, it shouldn't come apart easily. But uh, they do use the word tamper-proof, which I find interesting. Uh, so let's use a different example. What about actual tamper companies? Tamper-evident labels. Uh, this, in this case, an adhesive. So it says, impossible to reseal or reuse. Uh, we'll talk about mechanical seals, one of these little guys. And it says, positively tamper-proof. And you'll laugh at that in a moment. So what makes something tamper-evident? It's durable for whatever, whatever it needs to be durable for, but it's weak. It does not resist physical manipulation or, or removal. It, they're generally one-way lock mechanisms. Tamper-evident devices should not be resealable, because then essentially they become a lock, which can be opened and closed surreptitiously. Uh, they usually have unique identifiers. Most of these here have uh, a serial number, so that if you were just to try and replace it, that would be obvious, you know, when the person comes to inspect it. The, our, our friend, the fire extinguisher, does not have a serial number. But again, it's just a fire extinguisher. Uh, most of these are very sensitive to almost anything. So when you, when you have a, uh, a tamper seal, 
This is a cable seal we'll talk about in a minute. Oh, is something stuck? Yeah, there we go. So it's just this little wire. And so, see, I pull it to make sure it's, it's closed, right? So that's called the tug test. You tug it, make sure you feel. Some have uh, a little bit of play, so you can incorporate that into your inspection to see, you know, if it doesn't have play, that means it may have been tampered with. But these are all very, very weak to everything you can imagine. So how do we inspect these? Because, again, uh, when we defeat these technologies, we usually defeat the person. You know, it requires somebody to inspect it, to actually look and detect tampering. Uh, and, again, better devices should make tampering more evident should be easier to spot. But that makes us lazy, usually. Uh, so again, we could just look at it. You know, you see, you see this is on here. Or <laughs> our friend here, I'll just leave him up here. And we see, OK, that looks fine. Passes the tug test. Uh, you know, you <laughs> somebody just said, that's what she said. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you can also inspect it very closely, see if there's any little tool marks, any parts missing, anything melted, anything damaged, discolored. You can also disassemble it. We can cut this seal apart. Uh, we'll use this one since it's basically the same thing. Uh, we could cut this seal apart and look at all the, if there's any inside pieces and see if they have tool marks or damage or have been replaced. Uh, and then you can get really hardcore about it, but nobody does. Uh, governments and intelligence agencies do, nobody else does, because nobody has the resources or the time or, frankly, the patience. Uh, and then you can also think uh, there's, you can incorporate traps and alarms to make evident, uh, tamper evidence more easy to spot. So you think of the department store with all their little ink things. So if you walk out, it sprays ink everywhere. That's considered a, a trap. Uh, in the same sense, if you walk out and it has the, the little uh, tag on it that starts the machines all beeping and all the security guards tackle you, that's considered an alarm. So what does defeating a tamper seal mean? So tampering, again, is a gray term that, that's hard to define. You know, is removing it tampering? Uh, is cutting it open tampering? Is replacing it tampering? The answer is yes for probably everything you could think of, if you can think of a definition for tampering. And a true tamper evidence seal should attempt to defend against as many things as possible. But as far as defeating it, just tearing it off doesn't count as a defeat, because that leaves evidence. So when we defeat a tamper seal, we either make it so that we open it and close it without the inspector being able to identify it, or we replace it without them being able to identify it. Because if you replace it, you could just rip off what's there and put a new one on. But again, it has to have all these same characteristics, has to have the play, has to have the serial number, all the markings, color, all that sort of stuff. Any questions up to this point? We'll talk about actual seals soon. So there's, there's essentially vulnerabilities in every stage of the design up to you actually tearing off a tamper seal for, as part of your actual process. So there's problems with design, problems that the end user can't really fix. There's problems with procurement. Think of if you set up a fake tamper company and sell them flawed seals that are easier to defeat in some way, but they pass all this normal tug test examination stuff. Think of how you store it. What if seals are tampered with before they're actually put in use. Think of installation. Could there be problems with installation? Some of these devices aren't straightforward to, to install, with the exception of probably the bolt seal, which just bolts together. What about inspection? Inspection is probably the biggest area of attack, because you know the, the level of defeat you require is only as good as the inspector that's going to actually look at the tamper seal at the, end of the, at the end of the day. And then there's also problems with uh, removal and disposal. Uh, around where I'm from, uh, the, the gas and power people just tear off the old ones whenever they need to and throw it next to them. So I have a big pile of, of, uh, of power company seals, which could probably be modified to make counterfeits. So the first thing we're going to talk about uh, is mechanical seals. And these are seals that mechanically lock, uh, quote unquote, lock something, right? They're physical barriers to whatever you're trying to get into. So in most of these cases, think of a hasp, right? And, and you know, normally we would put a padlock on it. But think of what the difference is if we put a, a tamper seal on it. So zip ties, seriously, zip ties, not a joke. Uh, so a show of hands, how many of you, if I gave you a zip tie, can open it? OK, keep your hands up. How many of you think you would still be able to open it if I pulled it tight? Right? 
Okay, well, let's look at our first actual seal. This is called a beaded cable seal. And it's just this little beaded leg, and it goes through the body. And once it goes through the body, you're not supposed to be able to pull it out. So guess what it is? A zip tie, a three-sided zip tie, essentially, is what this is, right? And this talk isn't really about naming manufacturers and saying people are liable. It's just about what tamper seals are and why some of them are flawed and what we can do to improve them. So this is a zip tie. How many of you think you could open this? Ah, oh, not as confident now. So the first thing we can do is we can simply shim it. And we can do this with zip ties too. So I already have the shim uh, sort of inserted. You can see it passes the tug test. Come here. In the red. Come here. So just lightly tug on it or you break it. Just make sure it's sealed. You sealed? Give them a thumbs up if it's sealed. OK. OK, so I've inserted a high-tech Coke can. And uh, I've just rolled it up and got it around the cable. And I'm just going to push it through while pushing the cable through. And if I'm not a retard, you can open it. Right? Thank, thank you for that one laugh, or one clap, sir. That guy was like, man, nobody else clapped. So that's it. And then if you want, you could pass this one around. And you could look at it. And I was playing with it before, so there might be little scrape marks. But for the most part, it's very difficult to tell. And there's tons of these. Uh, this is essentially the theme for half of the products most manufacturers make, is this basic zip tie idea of, of you know, uh, we have uh, a little piece that goes in, and you're not supposed to come out. Essentially, a zip tie. Now, they're serialized zip ties, to their credit, uh, but they're all very easy to defeat. The next seal we're going to talk about is called a plunger seal. Uh, just a note on naming. These are my names for them, because every company picks retarded names for them, like truck seal. So there's 50 things that are truck seal that are all different. So I'm calling it what it looks like. So those are beaded cable seals, or just you know fancy zip ties is one of my preferred terms. Uh, this is called the plunger seal. And so it's a fixed length, obviously serialized, little piece of plastic, right? And it just clips into the other end, and you're not supposed to be able to, to open it. So the internals look something like this. Uh, it's sort of like a zip tie, but instead of you know, our normal, what we're used to, they close off one end. They cap it. Right? So this plunger just goes in and snaps in behind those little teeth. And then they designed the plunger itself to be more, I'm pointing here like you guys can see it. But uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, uh, they designed it so that it's you know, hard to get your little shim material into there, because you have to go through you know, two 90-degree bends. And, uh, but they cap it on most of these. So what's the obvious method of attack? Decap it, right? So uh, oh, and I totally forgot to mention my, thing, my notes. Uh, <laughs> the other qualification I have is I'm the leader of the motherfucking professionals, which is the team that won the tamper contest last year at DEF CON, and will win this year. <laughs> um, so we have a very extensive uh, counterfeit part collection. So think, you don't need to counterfeit the entire seal. You just need to counterfeit the parts that, that allow you access to open it. So we have a giant box of different color caps that we've pulled from other seals. And these are, you know, just think if you buy, you know, 10 of each color, and you just sit there with an X-Acto knife, you could cut each of these caps out. Uh, there's other techniques to remove them, but we don't really have time for that. Uh, but just, just look. And also inside, we also have replacement uh, little detainers. So in case we we mar them up with, with an X-Acto knife or, or something that we're using to you know, actually open the seal, then we can always replace those too. Because none of these little tiny pieces are going to be serialized for the majority of these seals. The other thing we're going to talk about are, uh, they're, they're essentially the same thing. They're just little tiny versions of plunger seals. And uh, if you remember our, our power company example, these are essentially what they use on the vast majority of, uh, of little power, power meters. Just this little tiny piece of plastic that you could easily rip open with your hands, uh, usually a serial number or, or uh, an identifier for you know, whatever company. I, I don't know in Las Vegas who handles water and power, but probably whatever their initials are on that. And it's essentially the same thing. No cap, but now we have, on most of these, we have access to both ends of little holes. So you can imagine all the ways we can shim or counterfeit this little tiny seal. And if you notice, the one on the left does not have a serial number. 
Now, it probably should, but think if we have a blank, we could always, you know, determine what the method of printing is, print our own serial number on there, and just replace it, as long as we have, you know, color and serial number right. There's also uh, what are called padlock seals, and they resemble padlocks. Now, the one on the left is a little bit better. It's essentially just a spring-loaded detainer, so when you, you put the shackle in, it uh, snaps into place, and you can't take it back. So we can always drill out and replace the, the shackle on the one on the left. Uh, the one on the right is similar. Uh, you see it has this little flag here where a serial number should also be on the shackle. This one has no serial number on the body, but we can, let's assume it could. So the insides look like that. It's just this little brass clip that springs out, and when you try and pull it out, it doesn't work. So we could take a high-tech lockpick, and we could just push those out of the way. But what I thought was a really funny attack was you could take a second clip, and you have just enough room. Probably better if you filed one down to take both out. And then you take your original, and you just snap it back into place. Here, you want to try? Well, I'll give you both. So yeah, pretty easy. And this seal that, that just got handed out is used uh, primarily in hospitals to seal up drugs and dangerous chemicals and all sorts of other fun stuff that they have in hospitals for all the biohazard boxes that we steal on a regular basis and, and such. Oh, what's that? It's cheap. It's very cheap. I'm sure that's one of the least expensive seals you can buy. But uh, it doesn't really do a job. You could probably buy a padlock for a dollar more. That would be better. So uh, there's another type of padlock seal, which is, uh, depending on the design, you know, it's hard to say what seal is better than others because it's, it's very dependent on the company that makes it and, you know, the actual design that they use and, and the procedures they use to distribute it and, you know, the, the variety of colors and, and other kind of crap that they do. But these are just little one-way locks as well, and they just clip into the little plastic body. They, they have all-metal versions, but the vast majority in use are, are plastic, and these are also used by a lot of uh, power and gas companies for the meters. Uh, and again, the body's serialized. The inside is just these little teeth, so once you clamp it down, you're not supposed to be able to pull back up. And those little legs that, that force into the plastic are actually pretty strong and have a lot of force on them, so they dig in quite well. So you might be thinking, oh, well, can't we just stick a lockpick in there and bend them out? It's actually surprisingly difficult. So what our, our tamper team came up with for a cool defeat, it's uh, maybe not altogether practical in the field, but uh, we do electrolysis on it and dissolve the, the plastic clip. Now, I think, honestly, you could do this in the field. Uh, it takes about a uh, half hour, half hour to fully dissolve uh, both sides. And the, the, the great thing is, you don't need to do this while it's actually sealed on something. You clip the little ring, and then you put it in your solution, and then you, you wait until you get all this. Now, you do need a replacement clip. So that's why we have a big box of replacement clips from all the different types of padlock seals we found. And uh, I don't think we found any, any seals that actually resist this, of this type, except for the all-metal ones, because obviously the all-metal ones would go away completely. But, uh, but uh, when you're done, you get that, and then you can just pop a new clip in. And it doesn't damage the plastic, doesn't discolor the ink. Uh, previously, we were using uh, uh, muriatic acid and water for, well, I guess that just makes it more or less muriatic. Uh, and uh, we were, it took about two hours, but we realized we didn't need the electrolyte from the, the, the muriatic acid, and now we're just using salt water. So it's a lot safer, and we don't have to bit, put big signs up at the contest to say, stay the fuck away from this cup. Not a joke, not a joke. Uh, we talked about it uh, just briefly earlier, uh, metal cable seals. And it's essentially just this body, and you know, your, your metal cable strand goes through, and then it gets locked in place. Can't pull it out. So what it is, is there's this little gear. And when you first put the, the end of the cable in, it pushes the gear into this hole, and then there's a spring that pushes up into the cable. <clears throat> and that's what makes it so you can't pull out. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but uh, so let's talk about, uh, we talked about how there's different flaws in the different parts of, uh, of the tamper process, or the, the, the I'm retarded, uh, how there's flaws in design and installation, and what if you have access to it before it's installed? So does this seal look sealed? 
Right? Looks good? Well, oh, 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 that's hot, right? So what's in here is just a little shim piece, just a little piece of metal that holds that piece down. So if the person installing it uh, doesn't check that it's actually sealed, you know, if they just pull it tight, because you think, well, that's, that looks fine, you know, then they may not, uh, they might not notice. So think of all these little attacks. And with the plunger seals, what you could do is, uh, say you have access to them before they're installed, you can cut off some of those legs so that only one leg actually holds the plunger back. Um, and then think of how much easier it would be to shim if you only have to remove one leg from the plunger. And the same is true here. What we can also do is use another high-tech piece of metal, and we can physically block the, the little uh, gear from touching the cable. And so we just take our shim, see which end's thinner. Just take our shim, you place it in, and with this one, it's, it's kind of shitty, to be honest, because it's one of the small ones and it's not really used for anything important. And usually you have to tighten with the cable. So you're dragging it through with the cable and then it eventually blocks. But with this one, you can just kind of push it through because there's enough tolerance between the, the wall and the cable. So I'm tightening it now, make sure it goes in. And then I'm going to hold the shim in place, pull our cable out. <laughs> I like that it takes one person clapping to motivate the rest of you. So does anybody want to try this? Don't get it stuck for the other 90 rows. But uh, I'll pass this around. You have the shim. So just get it in there and then hold it with the cable, push it through. Yeah, well, it's small. If you cut yourself, you're retarded, so. <laughs> but to be fair, I, I just got done with a two-day black hat class, uh, Monday, Tuesday, on tampering stuff, and we went through the whole box of Band-Aids, uh, three or four of which I'm proud to say were my own. So don't feel bad if you cut yourself, but we will point and laugh at you. <clears throat> Some other defeats for these, you know, because you consider it's just a little spring-loaded gear. Uh, some of them are ferrous. So you could, uh, well, there, there's a bullshit discussion with John about whether or not magnets pull or push. I'm actually not very good at science. I flunked physics. So you, the idea is that you pull away the little gear, and then the cable's free in the same sense that if you put the shim through, there's a barrier. But you could do this with magnets, and one of the teams last year at the DEF CON contest did this. Now, you need a bigger magnet for the bigger seals. That's one of the, the smallest ones that they make, but it's the same idea. Now, this one's actually a very cool seal. Uh, and this is the first, well, technically, uh, the higher level cable seals are approved by Customs and Border Patrol. And a, uh, an agreement called CTPAT, which means uh, Transit, Transportation Protection and Anti Terrorism. And that's what Customs uses to, to you know, ensure cargo reliability and tamper evidence and so on and so forth. So the, the big cable seals are, are similar. Uh, this is the second one that they approve. And they only approve three mechanical seals, three types of mechanical seal, uh, about five models in total of, between the three. So I believe it's two cable seals, two bolt seals, and, and this metal, metal ball seal. And so what it is, is inside there's these little rings. So on the top is it before we, we close it. And you know normally there's a ball over it, but you get the inside view. And so there's these little red metal rings, and they, they are sheared. They don't go all the way through in the top. They clip onto the metal, and they just hold themselves there by the force of the, the ring pushing into the metal. Now when you push the cable through, it physically moves those rings, and they snap through the second hole. And then they have room to rotate and spin, and you can't pull your strap back out. So it's a very, very simple but ingenious design. And every company I can find that sells these represent them as tamper-proof in big red level. Reg Whoa, big red letters. Let me get some more water. So let's think about how can we defeat this. It's tamper-proof, which may deter us. But uh, can we pick it? Can we rotate those rings back and spread them to get the strap through? Probably, but it's going to be very difficult. You know, if it was run one ring, it might be a bit easier. Uh, but the fact that there's two or more usually, uh, typically two, uh, makes it a bit more difficult. And uh, it's possible, but you'll probably scrape up all the metal, you know, sitting there jiggling rings back and forth and spinning them, which will leave evidence of tampering. 
Uh, now, whether or not you can repair that, that you know, scrapes and, and uh, removal of paint and so on and so forth is another story, and it's another way of attacking it. But let's, let's consider picking to be too difficult. Can we shear and repair the strap? So can we cut it open and then somehow repair it? Again, it has to pass the tug test, so that may or may not be too difficult. Can we counterfeit it? Uh, can we change the serial number? Can we, can we you know, replicate this? Obviously, if you're an intelligence agency or a giant manufacturing corporate company, some of these might be a little easier than others. But all of the attacks we're going to talk today are very low tech. And there's a group called the Vulnerability Assessment Team at uh, Argonne. And they did a big study on, on a couple hundred seals and found that, uh, that uh, it's, it doesn't really matter whether or not you spend more money on your, on your seals because you know, the cost of defeat is almost always extremely low. And when you spend more money, you don't necessarily prevent tampering for longer or make it more difficult. So we can change the serial number theoretically, but it's very difficult, requires a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of preparation. Uh, we can also replace parts. What else? Anybody? OK. Well, what we thought of was pretty funny, was that if we look back at our seal, so what's the only thing that's, that's not unique about this? The ball. So can we remake a ball? Now, remake a, remaking a ball from scratch is pretty hard. But what if you take halves of other balls and you build an awesome recrimping die? So essentially what you do, you find your target seal. You cut your, your ball off with a Dremel, being careful not to nick the strap anywhere. You undo the rings to open it and take it off whatever it is. Then you put it flat. You put half your ball on. You put your rings back on. You put your other half on, because that's how the, I assume they make it at the factory. And then you recrimp it with just this little hand tool. And it's just these two little pieces of metal that you can hit with a hammer very softly. And then you get tampered seals. So can you tell which ones in that photo are tampered? One, two, how many think uh, all three of them were tampered? <laughs> that man voted twice. How many of you think two of them have been tampered? How many of you think one of them has been tampered? How many of you are gullible enough to think zero of them have been tampered? <laughs> well, the answer is two out of those three have been tampered. Can you tell which ones? Now, obviously, this is a bit flawed just looking at a photo with you know, a single view of the, of the seals. What's that? How? Well, but the other one has scrapes. What about the scrapes here? Linear scrapes. That's, that man must be a forensic expert. Well, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> the next seal we're going to talk about are called bolt seals. And they're the third seal uh, approved by Customs and Border Patrol. And so bolt seals, again, are just these one-way locks. They snap into place. So here's a cutaway view. And what it is is usually just a little clip or a little ring. And when you force your, 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 your big piece into the body, then it just snaps into place and makes it so you can't pull it out. And so tampering with these can be very difficult. Again, let's look at our examples. So you can see there's a wide variety of different bolt seals available. There's some that are all plastic. There's one here that has a double serial number. There's one here that has you know, just a metal bolt and a single serial number, and so on and so forth. So what can we do? Well, the first thing we can do, and this works a bit better on all metal seals, or at least seals with uh, an only metal bolt, is you just shear the bolt at one of the bases, and then you, you, you can add a screw and re-screw it back in and, and make it feel right. Because again, they're not going to notice these things just looking at it from a foot away. They'd have to actually tug on it, and you'll probably pass a tug test if you do this properly. And then to see this little mark, they'd have to look at it very closely. So we consider this a level one or a level two defeat, because it's not perfect, but it'll probably fool most, pe most people. And if you look at, at one of these seals that we had, oh, I guess this is a better photo, you see on the left, where the, I'm pointing again at my screen, uh, if you see over here, it has these little stumps, and that's to try and prevent you from cutting it off on this edge. And on this side, it has a bit of a slope, so it's supposed to be more easy to detect. But again, you, you, your tamper evident devices are only as good as your inspector. The other thing we could do is drill and repair or replace the bolt. You know, think about the all-metal bolts, uh, a bit easier to replace uh, and a bit easier to resurface and reserialize if we have to go through that much trouble. All plastic makes it a bit more difficult. Uh, the all plastic ones are, are more common for some of the higher security stuff because they're also corrosion resistant because, you know, they got the buffer of plastic around all the metal. 
So let's talk about more consumer level stuff. Uh, these are called crimps and wraps. So we have some similar mechanical seals that are crimped. And so this one on the left, you can see it just has a big flag hanging out. And there's a special crimping tool that just rolls the flag around whatever wire you're trying to seal. And on the right, you can see an example of it over a, a little box hasp. This is a more uh, sophisticated version, which is used on a lot of uh, gas companies use this on their meters. And it's just a, a copper or steel, whatever type of wire, threaded through a little piece of lead, and then they crimp it. And so it, it squishes itself and physically restricts the wire from moving. So we could, we could defeat these two. These are usually easy to counterfeit. If you look at our previous example, you see it has some markings, but that's probably on every single one that they sell. So it's easy to replace. All you need is the you know, $40 or $50 crimping tool to redo the crimp. And the same goes for most of these. Now, there's obviously more sophisticated ones. There's, there's plastic versions of this. But they're all the same idea, that you squish them, and then it's hard to get the wire out. And then whether or not uh, the actual security they offer is up for debate. So the one nice thing is that if you're very, very thorough about your forensic examination of these, the way the metal deforms and the actual tool pattern of the, 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 the crimper that you're using is probably easy to identify. So if you look at this one on the bottom here, you can see how it folds and distorts the metal. You can take a photo of this, and then if you're diligent enough, you can inspect it very thoroughly at its destination to determine if it's the same seal or if it's been counterfeited. Uh, so there's a photo of just one of the seal crimping tools, just a simple hand tool. There's also these seals called self-crimping self seals. And what it is is you thread, again, a wire through the back of it, and then you just snap it closed, and you can do it with your fingers. Uh, unfortunately, all the ones I found for these suck really bad, and you could just take a lockpick and bend all the little pieces that are supposed to hold it together out and then open it up and then re-snap it and so on and so forth. So plastic wraps are something you're all familiar with. Um, plastic wraps are funny because they're extremely common and they vary quite a bit. Some companies put them on just because, you know, why not? Some are forced to, like drug and uh, pharmaceutical companies. But the real question is, what are your goals? If it's a bottle of pills, what's your goal? Is your goal to open it completely and have full access to the pills? Is your goal just to put a doping agent, you know, on some of the pills so that when somebody eats it, they'll drop dead? Uh, there's a lot of different things that, that don't really line up. So yes, it does restrict movement of the cap, but does that matter? Would somebody notice a hole somewhere else? And so on and so forth. So of course these can be defeated also. Uh, some of them you could just physically kind of wiggle and get them off if they don't use a big enough undercut for the, the wrap itself. Uh, some you could just cut just enough to take it off and then repair it with uh, either heat or glue. Uh, a lot of these aren't serialized, so you could just always replace them with a counterfeit version. And, you know, all, all the same attacks. You know, use your brain. Uh, don't think of this talk as, you know, well, Datagram said this is the best way to attack a CEO. Datagram thinks this, or Datagram can't, can't do this one perfect. It doesn't matter, because, again, it's super dependent on the actual person inspecting it. So, obviously, when I try and think up defeats, I think up ones that, that the more forensic inspectors would miss. But it's not like lock picking, where it's a binary thing. Is the lock open or, or closed? You know, tamper is much more vague than that because of the human element. So we're going to talk about adhesives now. And uh, adhesives are pretty cool. Uh, there's no standards available in the US for the, the strength of an adhesive. So it's hard to tell one from the other. Uh, and they have very mixed effectiveness. Uh, they're misunderstood. You know, think of all the combinations of things you need to think about to determine if the adhesive is right for what you want. You need to think about what you're going to put it on. You need to think about the backing of the adhesive, the actual you know, plastic part of it, the adhesive it uses, how the adhesive works with whatever you're putting on. You need to think about how long does, this, does the adhesive have to cure before it starts on its trip to wherever it's going, because that makes a huge difference. You know, think of if you just glue something and you wait five seconds to pull your hand away. It's probably going to break. Well, the same is true of tape to, to a smaller degree. You know, if you don't give tape enough time to cure, then it's not going to adhere as strongly and it's going to be less resistant, less resistant to a number of attacks. So the first thing you could do is just try and shim it off. Use like a, a, a Coke can, and just try and get under it and shear the adhesive. And then you, you break it off, and there'll be some adhesive left on, we'll, we'll say a box for all these examples, and then some left on the tape. And you could just put it back when you're done. And you, know, you may or not be able to do this without it looking weird. You could also think of water or steam. Is, is the adhesive water soluble? Can we just remove it and then reapply the adhesive? Uh, can we steam it off if it's one of those paper tapes? 
can we use solvents to, to either remove the adhesive or create a barrier between it and the substrate? Can we use temperature, hot or cold? And can we always counterfeit it? So that, that's a good question, is can we counterfeit it? It's almost always the first, first question because counterfeiting is usually the easiest defeat if you have the resources for it. So many adhesives, despite saying tamper evident, I gotta stop laughing because I keep fucking it up. Uh, many adhesives offer zero security. And they're essentially glorified stickers in the same way that some of the others were glorified zip ties. So this tape in the photo, not very tamper evident. Uh, the idea is that those lines, that if you cut them, it's really hard to, to realign them. But what if you don't cut them? Then it's really easy to take off. So again, we ask ourselves some questions. Is it serializes? What's it applied to? Uh, what is the material? What type of residue does it leave behind? Because you know, some tamper tapes will leave behind a big void or open message. And how much do you really need to remove? Because that cuts down on your, your time to tamper. You know, if I only need to remove half of it to open something, then it's a lot faster than if I need to do the entire thing. And it usually requires less resources. So we, there's two, technically three types of residues. There's what's called full residue. I'll just go through it here. Uh, there's full residue, which leaves uh, residue along the entire width of the tape. And then there's partial residue, which just leaves a bit. So some might have a transparent full residue. You, you can see it because the contrast is kind of screwy. But if you look right here, you'll see there's a line. And then up here, there's another line. Uh, but this one just has the letters saying, you know, this has been opened or whatever. There's also no residue tapes, which are usually just very small uh, adhesives. And when you pull them off, it leaves nothing on, on the surface but it, it makes the letters void or whatever appear on the actual tape itself and usually ruins the adhesive so that you can't re-adhere it to something. So let's talk about solvents. Uh, solvents are probably my favorite attack because they have the most cloak and dagger appeal to me. And I get huge boners for CIA stuff. I'll try and control myself though. So here's a photo of me removing just EFF tape, you know, this, the EFF disclaimer tape that says, you know, we, we do this and that and that. And well, I'm just removing it with some, some basic stuff. And all the stuff that we're talking about, you know, Coke cans I'm sure you can acquire, uh, you know, syringes, needles, solvents, all this stuff is very easy to acquire. It's just hardware stuff, hardware store stuff, drug stores, and uh, arts and craft stores, funnily enough. Uh, so let's talk about what common solvents are. Acetone is very good. Isopropyl alcohol. Uh, literally, we can walk down the, the nail polish remover aisle in the market and pick all sorts of awesome solvents that are great for tamper. Uh, carbon tetrachloride is used, well, was used heavily by uh, intelligence agencies, but we can't use it because we're afraid to die. Uh, but apparently, it's awesome at, at removing tape, so something to think about. Uh, I think it might be illegal in this state. I'm not sure. In a lot of states, it's not legal anymore. There's also MEC, methyl alpha ketone. The list really just goes on. You know, it, it's a 10-year chemistry course to think of all this stuff. Uh, there's also a cool fluid called stamp lift fluid, which uh, stamp collectors use. You know, they, they don't want to have to use an X-Acto knife and cut out their stamp from, from the envelope to make it look nice. So they, they put it on the back of the envelope, and then that releases the stamp. Now, a lot of old stamps will use the same adhesive as most envelopes. So it also works to put it on top of the envelope flap and it, it soaks through and dissolves the adhesive or makes it weak enough that you could lift it. And again, there's, there's a huge number of chemicals that you could use. Uh, most are available at the hardware store or the drug store. So let's talk about how do we inspect adhesives? Because mechanical seals, we do the tug test. Uh, with uh, adhesives, we want to look at them. And so we want to find all these different things. We want to find any cuts or tears or wrinkles. You know, we want to find distortion or smearing and if there's words printed on it or you know, a pattern. Uh, and then any changes that we can. Again, this all depends on how far you're willing to go to inspect these when they get to their destination and how far you're willing to prepare for that before they leave their destination. So some things we can look at. Incorrect solvent use will ov obviously be very messy, uh, especially for some of the higher grade tamper tapes. Uh, essentially just dissolves and then, you know, unless you can counterfeit that tape, it can be very difficult to fix. And then if you look at the box here, we also have all this blue ink bleeding into the box, so you'd need to figure out how to remove that as well. And here's a closer version after it's set for a little longer. You can see it just slowly dissolving all the tape and the backing. Uh, heat is good, but very easy to screw up on. If you put too much heat, uh, plastic will usually wrinkle and melt and so on and so forth. Uh, one other thing that a lot of people don't look for is the actual gloss. If you, if you, you kind of tilt it right in the light, you can see the gloss of the adhesive. Uh, most are glossy, some aren't. Um, and then 
determine, you know, is that normal? Does that look right? Because some solvents will actually affect that. Uh, they'll also affect the adhesive strength of the adhesive. So a true tamper test would be not to just cut the box open, but to try and peel up the adhesive. If it's supposed to leave a residue, you have to verify that it's leaving the correct residue. Because think of if somebody just took, you know, our blue tape and just put a blue tape and then painted it blue or whatever they did to fix it. You know, when you peel that up, if it doesn't react the same way as, you know, a, a real one would, then that's evidence of tampering. Uh, and then again, heat will ruin a lot of stuff. This is an acetate-based uh, evidence bag security label, and heat makes it bubble and go all crazy. And you can see even the letters are all warped up here. Uh, we talked about how some solvents might remove the adhesive. A lot just lift it. A lot, a lot create a buffer between whatever you're applying it to and the tape and allow you to just pull it off. And then once they dry out a bit, you could just restick it as if it was a normal tape. Uh, if you have to add glue, uh, it could be very messy. And you can see here around the edges, there's some glue. And because there's glue, a lot of little hair and fiber got stuck around the edges. Uh, if you have to use a spray adhesive, you need to consider that, you know, uh, an aerosol can has propellant, and that will be on whatever you spray. So here's a photo of spray adhesive being reapplied to a tape, and that's obviously not normal for the, you know, I don't know about you, but the tape I buy, I don't need to sit there with the can. So what else? We talked about some basic mechanicals. We talked about uh, adhesive seals. There's obviously a lot more. You know, in the history section, we went over a few. There's uh, electronics, or one of the big ones. But it's hard to give a talk on those because they're so different from traditional tamper seals. There's plenty more. You know, think of envelopes. Think of wax seals, uh, the clay seals we talked about earlier. Uh, plenty more seals if you're, if you're somehow interested in this and crazy like I am. Uh, thanks, Dark Tangent, by the way, for creating this. Uh, and then there's lots of practice. Lots of defeats are not easy. You know, some of the stuff I showed is pretty simple once you get the hang of it, but some require many hours, weeks, even months of practice to do properly. Because again, you know, as people who just you know, like to hack and do stuff, you know, you wouldn't hack a machine and leave a big sign saying it's been hacked. You want to leave as little evidence as possible. So, you know, you go deeper and deeper into this. You get better and better at it, and less and less people will be able to inspect it and determine if tampering has occurred. Uh, so on that note, we can think, how do we improve our defeats to leave less evidence, to require us to do less repairs or, or replacements of parts and so on? And on the flip side, how do we improve our, all of our, you know, uh, policies for installing and inspecting and disposing of seals to, uh, to make this process easier for both, you know, the inspectors and all the people that have to use and be around these seals? And those questions are very dependent on your application. Um, I think one thing that's difficult, because, you know, uh, in my humble opinion, talks like this haven't been given very much, that w it's very hard to determine what's a good seal and what's not. Like, you know, all the ones I passed out, you know, say, oh, okay, it locks. But it, unless you actually go through all the trouble of, of investigating all these technologies and uh, doing all, trying all these different things, you don't really know what that offers you, other than if somebody pulls it off, it's really obvious. So think of all these things. And think, you know, a lot of you use tamper seals in various forms, either mechanical seals. Uh, most of us probably use adhesive seals for our, our hardware products and so on. Uh, how do you integrate that knowledge into your business? You know, you need to think uh, as much as you can about this kind of stuff because it does make a difference. And, you know, I give a lot of lock picking and physical security talks because we focus heavily on, on digital security here. But the physical security is just as important. And if you think we're using tamper seals, you know, not just for pill bottles, but also to prevent other countries from violating treaties or, you know, make sure that our nuclear material isn't tampered with from, you know, point A to point B, that this, these things do matter as much as our SCADA systems or our beloved firewalls or our browsers and so on and so forth. So just think about all those things. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Please let me know if you have any questions. I think we have a bit of time. I actually don't know. <laughs> Yes, sir. In the competitions that you've done, what, what's given you the most trouble? Uh, the question is, in the competitions I've done, what's given me the most trouble? Uh, maybe plastic evidence bags, uh, just because those are frangible by nature. Can you announce, announcing tamperevidentwiki.com. It's a community site for us all to talk about tamper stuff. Okay. Uh, DT just informed me that uh, as soon as DEF CON starts, a site called tamperevidentwiki.com will be available.
Um, and we're going to, I think the contest will be using that to store all of our defeats and information about the seals. So if you want more information, go there as soon as DEF CON starts.